Thank you for inviting me to give this talk on Christopher Wren's medical discoveries, uh, entitled with a subtitle, Architect of Human Anatomy. And that word, arch architect, underlines, of course, his role in the visual portrayal of the results of the dissection and the experiments that his colleagues uh, were doing uh, with his collaboration. But also, uh, it was, as you'll see, much more than that, that he was an active participant in those experiments uh, and dis uh, dissections and discoveries. So this was very much beyond just dry anatomy of, of the bones or tissues. It was very much function, physiology, uh, functional architecture, you could say. So by way of lecture outline, I'm going to focus on five main areas uh, of Wren's contributions. First, in anatomy. Uh, then, in his role in introducing intravascular access. Uh, third, his role in advances in lung function and the near discovery of oxygen, which in turn led to cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, and then what I call some, some other things, a group of, of other things that don't fall into any of the above four categories. Um, so quite a range. Um, and, uh, you know, these are incredible topics. If, if Wren had, had done just that in the biomedical sciences, that would be enough to have a, a 300 celebration on. But as you know, uh, uh, and has been introduced, um, there were these other topics that he uh, made enormous contributions to, astronomy, physics, particularly optics, mathematics, architecture, of course. And if that wasn't enough, he was a member of parliament for uh, several, a couple of decades. And he founded the Royal Society in his spare time. Um, so it was the most remarkable um, individual. And his work in the medical sciences, which is the focus of today's talk, um, we must remind ourselves that he was not a qualified physician. So it really makes it all the more remarkable uh, when we uh, will touch upon what he actually did. But in some other ways, this lecture really isn't about Wren. Uh, you know, it's not a hagiography. It's not just Wren, Wren, Wren. The, the key thing to emphasize, and, and, and I think it's a very important thing, is that this was the f world's first, arguably the world's first research collaboration, the world's first research group that got together and systematically applied their skills and efforts to solving the problems uh, that we will talk about soon. And they themselves are very famous uh, names. Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law in Physics, uh, Hooke of Hooke's Law in Physics, and in fact his portrait uh, is at the back of the hall there uh, at this college. Richard Lower, John Mayhew, the great Thomas Willis, and many others. And of course in the background was William Harvey, who as you see from the dates, overlapped somewhat with them and indeed did meet and discuss things with them, but because of his age, wasn't an active participant uh, of this very active research group. So in a sense of disentangling who did what, there are going to be uh, in the history some blurred margins. They were all at it together. Um, and this sense of collaboration particularly applies to Wren. So to tease out some of his character, his biographers emphasize by how gracious he was in sharing his ideas. Uh, and that's why perhaps his name may not be attributed to many of the medical discoveries, and it's more along the architectural lines, but you'll see it, it probably well should have been. So his biographers write, Wren's notes were few. He gladly allowed others to borrow his ideas without attribution. Wren's contributions were significant in his own right. He saw the need for cooperative attack on problems, so bringing different skills together to solve uh, these problems of the time. And especially through his ideas, discovery, or pieces of apparatus, cheerfully appropriated by contemporaries like Hook and Boyle. So the biographers are saying that some of the things we attribute to them actually were probably his. Um, there's also a, a, a character of humility uh, in Wren. And here I defer to my architectural experts. Uh, so apologies if I've got the architectural details uh, you know, slightly incorrect, but roughly the Windsor Guildhall story goes like this, that at the peak of his powers as a, an internationally famous architect, Wren was commissioned by the councillors of Windsor to uh, build, design this Guildhall, uh, which is still there, and he designed it, uh, but with pillars only on the outside, and the councillors objected, saying, well, the ceiling's going to fall down. We, we insist on pillars inside as well to keep the thing up. And this went to and fro with Wren submitting different versions of the, uh, of the diagrams because uh, you know, he knew that they were wrong. Uh, 
Anyway, and his humility is such that he acceded. He, he did what they wanted, and he built the pillars. You know, internationally famous architect, as it were, respecting the wishes of you know, random councillors with no architectural experience. Anyway, a couple of hundred years later, the roof, the ceiling needed some work, and the workmen discovered that there was a gap between the top of the pillars and the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, they were useless pillars. They, they were non-supporting pillars. Um, a tiny gap, but it was there. And it was Wren's humility that he simply said yes at the end of the day, but also he had the last laugh. Of course he was right. These things were not needed at all, but there they are to this day. So to turn to the first theme, away from architecture, back to home territory in medical sciences, uh, the circle of Willis and brain anatomy. Now, Wren was part of this active research group, and he was actively dissecting. So this is uh, a print from the day uh, with uh, Willis leading the dissections, and there uh, next to him is Wren. Um, and Willis's interest, Willis was driven by an interest between the soul and the body and particularly to understand species differences. And he believed in this vague theory that this, there were three types of soul, what he called the vital, the rational, and the immortal. And he was using the process of dissection to try and understand that better, particularly dissection of the brain. And in these researches, the group named, I won't go through the list, but named uh, all these parts of the brain uh, as new things. Now, the list in itself forms almost the entire brain. I mean, that is an awful lot of structures that they uh, discovered or rediscovered uh, and named, you know, key structures that uh, neuroscientists, neurosurgeons today will well recognize. I'm indebted to my colleague at St. John's, uh, a successor of Willis's as professor of anatomy, who uh, marked uh, the birth of Thomas Willis uh, with an article. And uh, as Professor Zoltan Molnar noted, that Willis and Wren, through those identification of structures, had corrected much of the previous anatomy uh, of the previous few hundred years. But even they did get some things wrong. For example, there are 12 cranial nerves, but they mistakenly lumped two of them together to form one, the seventh and the eighth, and um, even more remarkably, the ninth, tenth, and eleventh, they seemed somehow to miss differentiating. So they did get things wrong, but these were huge advances. And Wren was doing the drawings. So Willis was doing the dissection, but all the drawings you see uh, in Cerebro Anatomy, which is the key book that Willis published, uh, are, are Wren's uh, alone. And in that drawings, it's worth considering how the brain's been portrayed through the ages. So, of course, uh, in ancient times, it was just you know, circles, circles within circles. Um, although there you can see uh, in the Egyptian uh, print, you know, the, the sense of nerves uh, just, at the, just at the bottom of that circle. And of course, da Vinci and Vesalius in the 16th century made huge advances through dissection. But in a sense, their um, portrayals were as they saw it. This was the brain as they dissected it. It's rather messy. It's very accurate in terms of what you see, but it's not particularly useful. And what becomes useful is Wren's very clear, crisp portrayal of the structures that he saw. Arguably, this is not what you actually see when you dissect the brain. It's what you think you see. In fact, today, we're, we're almost using Wren's picture to map onto what we see. Um, and it was with function in mind that uh, we think he did this, that he knew that this was going to be a map for future experimentation, perhaps for future dissection and future surgery, and this was the roadmap that pointed the way, a reference point. So it's very much more of a reference brain than is da Vinci's or Vesalius's. Now, in all this, Wren was helped by several things. Obviously, um, artistic developments, you know, developments in the arts. Um, for example, perspective, a much greater appreciation of that. And Wren, in fact, invented a device, a machine called the perspectograph, wherein he could uh, sort of trace out uh, uh, things using the machine uh, from what he saw, and that would help him draw the perspectives. Artist tools had improved, uh, and of course, print, printing had improved so that books like Cerebral Anatomy could actually be published in high quality. As I've said, Wren was really interested in presenting the pictures as a result of, uh, as the result of experimental dissection rissection rather than simply uh, as, as art, pieces of art as what we saw. 
This was really important. The third element uh, that helped was uh, his invention of injection of vessels, intravascular injection, which I will talk about in uh, the next slides. But he was able, using that invention, to inject dye into the vessels to provide contrast, which enabled Willis better to dissect and uh, to have a clearer result of the anatomy of the brain. Now, today, this is still used, and has been used for many years, in a process called cerebral angiography, where radiologists do inject a dye, usually now radio-opaque dye rather than a visible dye, to outline the uh, form and structure of the vessels of the brain. They also had some good luck. This was the fourth element. Well, it was lucky for them, but not so lucky for poor Samuel Mashbourne, the Wadham student, who was unfortunately struck by lightning and killed while punting uh, in the university parks. Now, this was um, uh, sort of good luck for dissection because hitherto, most, almost all the dissection uh, were on damaged, traumatized corpses, that, whether they were um, accidents uh, or hanging uh, or other mishaps. Uh, it was very rare to find uh, a cadaver that was uh, physically untouched. And we now know today that electrocution uh, really doesn't damage uh, structurally any of the internal organs, so they're completely, perfectly preserved. This is just electrical, um, uh, electrical death, as it were. Um, and uh, the mishap to the individual uh, enabled them to have a very clear um, uh, brain structure to work on to produce their results. So the key result uh, that, uh, apart from lots of other structures in the brain, the particular key result which Willis's name is attached to is what's called the circle of Willis. This is a group of arteries at the base of the brain, and you see it there, but uh, I've delineated it in red uh, for ease uh, of appearance there, and uh, that's with the neural tissue stripped away. And the brain is supplied by four vessels, two carotid arteries and two vertebral arteries, and the circle of Willis is a system by which they are interconnected. Well, so what, as it were? Well, the so what of it is that this is of uh, uh, great functional significance. Uh, if there was no circle and one of the arteries was blocked, uh, then uh, that entire part of the brain supplied by the artery, i.e. roughly a quarter, I'll simplify the proportions, uh, would be damaged with effectively a stroke. What the circle allows is contralateral flow, collateral flow. So even if one of the vessels is blocked, the blood, can use, the blood flow can use the circle to bypass it automatically. And that's the functional advantage. In evolutionary terms, it's an advantageous to have this evolutionary um, trait uh, and uh, inherit it. Now, the disease, the blockage, can be caused by this process of atherosclerosis, the narrowing, the furring up of the arteries. And if it happens in the carotid artery, carotid artery atherosclerosis, this can be treated surgically. But to operate on the vessel, the surgeon needs first to apply the clamp and to clamp the vessel so it doesn't continue to bleed during the surgery. But then we reach a paradox because the surgeon is clamping and obstructing flow and thereby stopping flow in the very vessel that they want to reduce, restore blood flow to. And that could itself cause a stroke. So the dilemma is how under general anesthesia would you know that the circle of Willis is patent and functioning well when the surgeon applies the clamp and the patient's not going to wake up having had a stroke. So that's the dilemma. Now, one doesn't actually know. It's very difficult unless you do the whole operation with the patient awake. So awake carotid arterectomy is a recommended advantageous way forward to successfully operate on this carotid artery. And there's the carotid artery with the surgeon just about to place a clamp on the right-hand side, and the patient is awake. And this is done by various means of injecting local anesthesia into the neck. But that needs to be precise for a successful uh, local anesthetic, because, of course, the surgeon's operating on a vital artery. And one of my connections, and at the end of the talk, I'm going to try and tease out some connections I have, albeit tenuous, although I'm very proud of them, with Wren uh, and Willis and this group. Because um, I was uh, privileged enough to do some research to describe... Uh, a more effective way of achieving this form of local anesthesia. And I did so with the help of Professor John Morris, uh, who was another successor of Thomas Willis as Professor of Anatomy in Oxford. And he and I did some classical dissection studies on the neck uh, 
Uh, and without going into details, we made some discoveries around what's called the deep cervical fascia, which enabled the placement of the local anesthetic much more effectively to achieve more successful surgery. But there's still a further dilemma. The patient's comfortable and awake, the surgeon's operating and starts to put a clamp, but then the patient starts to show symptoms. And so the surgeon releases the clamp and realizes they can't clamp. What to do now? Does the operation have to be abandoned? Not quite. It is possible to do a smaller operation and insert a shunt into the vessel that bypasses the area to be clamped. So we know the circle of Willis isn't patent, but we can then apply a shunt to bypass locally, as it were, the obstruction. Uh, and that allows the area to be clamped and operated on. One shunt was invented by the author Roald Dahl that uh, many of you may know of or heard of read his books. And Dahl invented it for um, treatment of hydrocephalus, which is swelling of the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid. And he did so because, unfortunately, his son at the age of four had a traumatic uh, car accident and developed hydrocephalus. And the shunts of those days to shunt away the cerebrospinal fluid kept blocking. So Dahl invented a new type of shunt. So it wasn't for this particular operation, but the principle was the same. Willis, in De Anima Brutorum, described the formation of cerebrospinal fluid, again assisted by Wren's drawings. Through comparative anatomy, they realized how cerebrospinal fluid was there across many of the species and approximately, quite accurately, how it was formed and its circulation. So there are these interesting connections um, in that uh, sphere. So we'll leave that aside and we'll move on to the second theme, which is intravascular access, which I've already said uh, Wren uh, invented uh, to help Willis delineate the vessels. And Wren was um, the first person, as far as we know, to cannulate a, a vein and to describe the equipment to do so. And there is a picture of probably roughly what he used. It may not be his exact one, but the feeling is that th this is what it looked like. Now, it's not that easy, necessarily. It's not that straightforward. Now, these days, we regard it as a routine thing to do. But a cannula has to be sharp to obviously pierce the skin and enter the vessel. And to be sharp, it has to be narrow and thin. But if it's too narrow and thin, well, that's no good. You won't be able to inject anything. So it has to be both sharp, but also wide. So there's that balance. And it has to be long enough to hold. If it's really short, you can't do anything with it. But if it's too long, again, there'll be that resistance to flow. So again, it just has to be just right. And then finally, you need a means of injection. And the syringe was invented much later. But at that time, they used a bladder attached to uh, the end of the cannula. And as I've said, Wren used this to delineate the vessels uh, of Circle of Willis, but there was more. Harvey had set the scene with his discovery of the circulation of blood. And I will go on to the background to that. So the question arose, well, what's the purpose of blood? What's the function of this circulation? Or can it be given a function? Can we use it in some way? And Wren's friend Boyle was you know, thinking and linking this to whether new drugs could be administered by this route into the blood. So hitherto, drugs were only ever ingested. But now that the blood's there circulating and Wren has discovered a way of getting things into the blood, can we do something more? I'll digress a little to talk about Harvey's uh, discovery of circulation, because it's quite central to the thinking that went on. The older theory was that blood sort of ebbed and flowed. It went to and from the heart in a sort of pendulum-like motion. But that theory relied on the blood mixing within the heart. And Harvey overturned that thinking in several ways. First, through anatomical um, dissections, he demonstrated, as had others, and he brought historical works to substantiate what he discovered, uh, that there is a septum in the heart that is not porous. So the septum of the heart divides the two sides of the heart and blood cannot mix. And secondly, valves in the veins don't permit backflow. So blood can only flow one way because of the valves in the veins. 
and varicose veins are when they fail, and it goes the other way. But he added to that with experimental work. And this is an experiment that's done in schools and in early medical school, which is easy to do. It's literally one you can do at home if you want, uh, which is you tie a ligature at the upper arm and the, the veins will become engorged. And you then use a finger to uh, squeeze blood out of the veins, and then you will see that they only fill in one direction and not the other direction. And of course, above the ligature, they don't fill at all. So a very simple, elegant experiment, but put together with everything else, it proves, as it were, the uh, circulation of the blood and overturns the ebb and flow theory. So there's the blood circulating, and there's Boyle poised to uh, um, you know, do something with this idea. So what did Wren and Boyle do? They gave the first anesthetic to a dog. And I'm indebted to my colleague, uh, just retired Professor Keith Dorrington, Professor of Physiology and Anesthesia in Oxford, uh, who's written a beautiful article in great detail of this particular uh, Wren uh, uh, discovery. Now, Boyle overturned, it were turned on its head, a saying of Paracelsus, the German physician. And Paracelsus had said, what differentiates a poison from a drug is the dose. So drugs and poisons are the same thing, and a poison is simply a drug in overdose. And Boyle said, well, hang on, I'm going to take that dictum and turn it on its head. If that's the case, then if I take a poison, something we regard as a poison, and give it in sufficiently controlled and smaller dose, I have a beneficial drug. And he summarized that philosophy in an essay of turning poisons into medicines. So that was his, his thesis. This was his driver. So, and it, it's unclear why they, they did it this way, but that's what they did. The poisons they chose were opium and alcohol. And using Wren's discovery of intravenous injection, intravascular injection, they injected a dog with opium and alcohol. And the dog became anesthetized. And Wren's words, these are Wren's words, are fascinating. The tincture, this mixture getting into the mass of blood, was quickly, by the circular motion of that, carried to the brain before the opium began to disclose its narcotic quality and presently after the dog appeared stupefied. So the words are really important, but the circular motion was here really important for the success of this. They were putting something in that circulated to the tissues. And they knew that this mixture was acting on the brain, that this is where consciousness resided and where you could induce anesthesia, no other part of the body. And the word narcosis is used interchangeably today with anesthesia. You know, we could narcotize patients, anesthetize patients. Unfortunately, they didn't take the next step, which is to realize they could operate on the dog without sensation and actually do something with this anesthesia that they had so elegantly described. They just regarded it as almost as an interesting thing, and the fact the dog survived proved Boyle's theory of being able to turn a poison into a beneficial medicine. Boyle was actually interested more in um, treating uh, sickness uh, and diarrhea rather than uh, inventing anesthesia. Now, the first true anesthetics were actually inhaled anesthetics that were introduced much later, in the mid-1800s. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's the famous picture of how they're given uh, originally. Um, and uh, one of the dangers of inhalational anesthesia, so intravenous anesthesia was forgotten, and inhalational anesthesia a couple of hundred years later came in. Now, one danger is what we call stage two of anesthesia. So just below the picture, you see a very rough sketch based on uh, a man called Goodell, who was an anesthetist at the turn of the last century, who described very carefully what happened uh, as someone went to sleep with an ether anesthetic. And stage one is when the patient starts falling asleep. But stage two is this paradoxical excitement. So the patient becomes agitated, moves the arms and legs, can bite the tongue, can vomit. So a very dangerous phase. And if the anesthetist is brave enough to keep holding the mask on and go through that stage two, you then enter the peace and calm and tranquility of stage three, and then you can do the operation. So the idea is to go through stage two, and then you're in safe territory. Intravenous anesthetics, being rapid in action, avoid or zip through stage two without there being anything to see. Okay, and that way, arguably, 
much more beneficial. And they were reintroduced in the 1930s with thiopentone. But their rapid action on the brain also involves rapid action on other organs. And we see much more depression of the heart and blood pressure. And this is the unfortunate Pearl Harbor story, slightly apocryphal, but useful nonetheless. The Japanese, in 1940, of course, attacked Pearl Harbor, and there were many casualties. In fact, the casualties weren't that severe. Uh, they were relatively moderate uh, injuries. Unfortunately, what they found was that a large number of the soldiers died uh, during surgery, disproportionate to the extent of their injuries. And late in the day, it was worked out the reason was that thiopentone, which had recently been introduced and was the rage of the day, was being given far too liberally and far too rapidly without prior resuscitation of the blood pressure. So this effect in zipping through stage two also zipped through the heart and the blood pressure in a most unfortunate way. Remarkably, as intravenous anesthetics were refined, we find that Wren's anesthetic mix was used until the 1970s, somewhat rediscovered. So some very distinguished anesthetists were describing its use opiate alcohol mixture, exactly the same, uh, for cardiac bypass. Now the reason is, in cardiac bypass, a bit like the shunt, the heart and the lungs are bypassed. Okay, they, and therefore, if the lungs are bypassed, they can't absorb the inhaled anesthetic. So you can't keep a patient asleep with an inhaled anesthetic during bypass. It has to be an intravenous anesthetic. But drugs like thiopentone accumulate too much, so the patient will take days or weeks to wake up. But opiate alcohol is just the right mix to achieve that balance and allow appropriate wake-up time, and it doesn't accumulate. So that's a picture of how you bypass the heart and the lungs and a modern-day bypass machine picture on the right. So this is still under the banner of uh, intravenous cannulation and where it led us, because the next stage it led us to was blood transfusion. Now this is where Wren took a step back and left Lower, his colleague, uh, to exploit it. And Lower developed uh, the cannula. And you see there the, the development of the cannula with Lower, and particularly the flanges to tie it down. Because, of course, for a blood transfusion, which is what Lowe was going to be interested in, it needed to be in place for a prolonged period. And that's really interesting, because you compare the picture above with what we use today, you see the similarities start to develop. You know, it's that long ago, hundreds of years ago, it's fascinating. And Lowe was the first to do an animal-to-animal -animal transfusion. He was beaten to animal-to-man by Dennis in Paris. But I don't think he should have felt too sad about that, because very soon afterwards, unsurprisingly, Dennis also had the first patient death and was arrested and got into a lot of trouble. And unfortunately, you know, it was like these inventions where something becomes all the rage, everyone starts to do it for whatever reason, you know, headaches, minor ailments, uh, and then the side effects start to appear, and these were very dramatic side effects. And of course, they weren't going to be solved until the discovery of... Uh, um, blood groups uh, in the 20th century. But anyway, it was recorded, and the ability to do it uh, was in posterity. So, moving away from intravenous access to the third theme, which is lung function. This was a fascinating comment at the time. Uh, Dr. Wren made use of this experiment, which was one of uh, his colleagues' experiments, uh, which we'll come to, Mayo's, to explain the motion of the muscles by explosion. So Wren was interested in the question of how muscles worked, and he felt that there was literally an explosion in the muscles that caused the contraction. And he was actually right, because the explosion in the sense of modern biochemical parlance is this equation, which is glucose combining with oxygen, exploding, as it were, to yield carbon dioxide and water and, of course, ATP, which is the molecule of energy. But it's a combustion process, what we call cellular respiration. And what Wren was referring to as an explosion was this combination, this volatile combination of some form of energy with some form of what we call oxygen. So this is the modern view of what Wren was describing, which is extremely interesting, 
In other words, Wren recognized in this and other observations that there was some link between the air that we breathe and a muscle explosion going on in the tissues. He further imagined that if you could somehow control the air that we breathe, you know, limit the volume, uh, you could have an instrument of respiration. And by straining the breath from fuliginous vapors, to try whether the same breath so purified will serve again. Can you rebreathe the air if it's confined in a bag or a sack? Now, we know we can't because we need to remove something that is fuliginous from it. So, remarkably, what Wren was describing here was a rebreathing apparatus, so long as that rebreathing could suck away what we know to be carbon dioxide. And this is exactly what we do today in an anesthetic breathing circuit. We use, commonly throughout the world, something called a circle system where we rebreathe the air in exactly the way that Wren described. The carbon dioxide is scrubbed by soda lime, again, in exactly the way that Wren described. And this saves on gas flows. It saves on oxygen and it saves on anesthetic vapor. So it's cost effective, but of course, in today's uh, interests, uh, it's also got a very good carbon footprint. So you only need about couple of hundred mils of fresh air going in for an overall minute volume of five liters a minute. So extremely efficient. So there I've drawn a diagram where on the left, the fresh air comes in at this very low rate. It picks up the anesthetic and goes into the circle system. The patient breathes and rebreathes that in a circular manner with the CO2 being absorbed by the CO2 absorber that you see there. And this can go on indefinitely. And there's the modern day picture of it. So it's fascinating that Wren imagined this to be possible and desirable. And this was all linked to his friend John Mayo's work on the, what we now know to be the near discovery of oxygen. So he used an adaptation of you know, Wren's imagined breathing device to design a sort of volumetric analysis of what happens with the air. Now, the prevailing theory of the time, rather like Harvey's ebb and flow theory, in respiration terms, was this theory of phlogiston. Now, it's really difficult to explain phlogiston. It's like a reverse oxygen. That's the closest I can come. It's actually something given off by burning objects, is phlogiston. And dephlogisticated air is therefore purified air. It's, I, it's impossible to describe it well, but I hope you get the gist of it as you come to see John Mayer's experiment. What he did was basically use an inverted flask over a, a, a tray of water. And inside the flask, he placed a small animal or at times a piece of burning wood or coal that he was able to ignite with a magnifying glass. And what he found was that with time, the level of water in the tray rose up inside the flask. Okay, the inescapable conclusion was that something was taken from the atmosphere. And we now know this to be oxygen. Now, he was lucky in those experiments because the water had impurities that were able to absorb the carbon dioxide to give this result. If you do it with distilled water or plastic, you don't get the same result. But um, it was much more dramatic because of uh, the um, equipment that he used. So this was Wren's rebreathing system used as volumetric analysis to prove that something was taken away from the air. Again, achingly, they didn't take that step and say, this is now oxygen. We have now overturned the phlogiston theory. They tried to interpret it in a complex way within the paradigm of phlogiston, which is unfortunate, and left it to Lavoisier in France uh, over 100 years later to actually discover oxygen uh, by chemical experiments. He observed that burning metals gained weight. They were oxidized, and they gained weight rather than lost weight. So they did not give off phlogiston. But combining this with earlier experiments, then the weight of evidence was towards oxygen. The fourth theme cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Now, before um, uh, the 17th century, uh, there were various ways. It was recognized that you could resuscitate the apparently dead, particularly recent drowning victims. This was a popular method, uh, which was to uh, flog them. Uh, so you pull the victim out, and you start flogging them with branches and birches. Um, this was suitably called the Russian method, which was to pack the victim in ice and hope for the best. And the opposite of that was to um, essentially set fire to the, to the patient. Uh, and, uh, you know, and neither worked terribly well. 
And then, of course, there was the trotting horse method, where you put the body over a horse and trotted round and round and again hoped. And there was no rhyme or reason to any of these at all. Uh, because as we now know, in order to have successful resuscitation, you need to know what the heart does and you need to know what the lungs do. And that's how you can have uh, a cardiac compression and uh, pulmonary ventilation, which is the mainstay of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. But in fact, um, our friends and Ren's friends knew all that because they had knowledge of the circulation and the knowledge of the heart as a pump from Harvey. And they were working on that. Lower had used cardiac massage in his experiments uh, in an animal to pump blood out of an artery to collect it. And he also noted that as he did so and ventilated the animal's lungs, the blood remained red. There was this inkling of something persisting here. Wren had developed this fantastic method of intravenous injection of drugs. And Mayo had nearly discovered oxygen. He you know, knew that there was something good about the air. So putting all that together, they were ready to apply this. And they had their opportunity with the unfortunate, but later fortunate story of Anne Green. Anne Green was a maid who had a stillbirth, but hid it. And uh, when the uh, body of the child, the fetus, was found, she was tried and very rapidly convicted of murder and hanged on the 14th of December in 1615, Carfax, in Oxford, in the center of Oxford. The friends, Willis and Petty, who was reader in anatomy, as was their right under the university statute, claimed the corpse and dragged Anne Green's body to Beam Hall, where they lived, where Willis lived, and they did their experiments. And this is where the friends got together. And she stayed there for some weeks, so uh, it's inevitable Wren would have been involved. It's difficult at this uh, distance from history to know who did what, but they applied their discoveries to resuscitate her. What they did is unclear, probably all of the above, but they were successful. She survived the hanging. And this was truly a miraculous uh, result, so much so that her conviction was quashed. And Anne lived for 15 years longer and bore three children. And this is all documented as the world's first resuscitation, applying all those early uh, methods. So the fifth group, this... Uh, uh, you know, a hodgepodge of other contributions, which in themselves are extremely significant. Uh, microscopy. So Hooke wrote the beautiful uh, book, Micrographia, using uh, the new, newly found uh, technique of microscopy, but Wren got there first. And Wren's drawings, which aren't actually in Micrographia, the Wren's are in the Royal Collection, are very, very similar. And uh, Hooke was inspired by them uh, to, to draw these small animals. Operative surgery, for some reason that is still unfathomed, uh, Wren wrote a monograph on how to perform a splenectomy, the taking out the spleen in a dog. Now, uh, yeah, I don't know why he did it, but uh, he did, uh, and it's a very difficult operation. It's a major operation to do. It's done for a number of reasons these days, including some cancers or trauma. But um, in his description, he was emphasizing the care with surgical ligatures to prevent blood loss as being something good to have good outcomes, careful suturing of skin, attention to detail, including post-operative care, so look after the dog afterwards. So very holistic. It's not just the surgery and anatomy, but he was looking at surgical outcomes. So it's a fascinating uh, uh, but isolated insight into his interest in surgery. He um, drew uh, biopsy specimens for Willis and his medical friends. Uh, this is from the Welcome Collection. At first sight, it looks like perhaps uh, you know, beautifully dyed cloth from an exotic Far Eastern country. What it actually is is the intestine dyed uh, for the pathology, and it shows hemorrhagic lesions, possibly due to colitis or tuberculosis. But it's a beautiful picture of itself. Again, Wren's drawings, his rendition of uh, yeah, pathology, which is otherwise crude uh, and inelegant, one could say. But this is uh, you know, pure elegance. Hospital design, not just experimental science, but the design of places to care for the sick. The Royal Hospital in Chelsea, uh, Wings of Greenwich Hospital, a hospital in Ireland, and uh, the now um, it's no longer exist, but the then College of Physicians in, in Warwick Lane. 
with the floor diagrams and uh, pictures. I'm going to finish with some personal points of contact uh, that I've had. I've mentioned uh, you know, this link with my interest in awake carotid surgery and the circle of Willis and how important that is. Mayo's oxygen consumption and this volumetric gas analysis was developed much later at the turn of the last century by a man called C.G. Douglas, who was tutor at St. John's College, Oxford, who invented the Douglas bag that generations of medical students have used. And what it is, it's a bag filled with oxygen and you either rebreathe from it or you breathe uh, one way with the one-way valve and breathe out into another bag. But the principle is the same as Mayu's. You're looking at the volume of oxygen that you're consuming and breathing and using that to estimate your metabolism, which is where that explosion of the muscles goes on. Douglas was the first of the modern-day respiratory physiology fellows at St. John's College, Oxford, succeeded by Bob Torrance. And the, the link there is that I've succeeded Torrance. So still using the volumetric analysis that Mayu uh, described all those hundreds of years ago in the same city. Another St. John's connection, I'm indebted to Professor Catherine Blundell, who's Gresham Professor of Astronomy, um, who uh, discovered this. I don't know how she did it, and, and neither of us knows how it happened or why. But Christopher Wren's father was a student at St. John's College, Oxford. And somehow he etched, or got his name etched, in a glass panel in a window of our old library. There's the, there's the window, there's the panel, and if I blow it up, you just about see his signature. I don't even know how you get that done on glass, so that's probably the subject of somebody else's lecture. And finally, the link, is that many of these experiments that I've described were done in this building, Beam Hall. And Beam Hall is interesting, uh, because it was built in 1187, and it's been in continuous occupation and use by students and professors. It's the oldest building, university building in the world, as a result of that. And the resuscitation of Anne Green happened here. This in discovery of the circle of Willis happened here. May use experiments. Everything was, was here. And it's had two important residents, obviously Thomas Willis, where he lived at this period, uh, and me. <laughs> Uh, because I was housed there as an undergraduate. It's now part of Corpus Christi College. And I just thought it was the most incredible thing to be living in the rooms where these things actually happened and have been documented as happening. So I finished, but I, normally it's the, question, it's, the, you know, it's the audience that asks the questions, but I do have burning questions. I have two. One is what would Wren and the Oxford group make of what we know now, especially in relation to anesthesia, which is my subject, or oxygen, which is what I research in. And I think their response would be rather mixed. I think they'd be kicking themselves because, because they were there. They, they got it. They got both of it, you know, right. But then they would concede that, yeah, we knew it all along. You know, we knew it was going to happen. We knew we were right. So I think it was mixed. The second question I have is, of all these things that went, Wren was doing from architecture to astronomy to medical science, which did he enjoy the most? What gave him the most satisfaction? You know, everything from splenectomy to designing St. Paul's. You know, what, and I, I, I'm afraid I don't know. So <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to take a question that's come in from outside. So it, in regards to the circle of Willis, do we know that the possibility of alternative routes of perfusion around the circle of Willis, presumably, was evolutionary adaptive? And which vertebrates share it? Oh, that's a gosh, that's a comparative, and I'm testing my comparative anatomy here. Um, evolution, well, uh, the evolutionary one's easier because um, there's a saying that uh, nothing makes sense except in the context of evolution. So if we see something, uh, we assume, uh, and we're probably right, that it has evolved uh, and it persists. Uh, so it, it's likely to be a, a good thing. Comparative anatomy, I'm afraid you've got me there. I think almost all the mammals, <laughs> but beyond that, uh, I, I'm, I'm really pushed. <laughs> so maybe there's someone, that, please, sir. There's a question at the front here. Thank you. Forgive me if I've missed something obvious, but when you described the fraught um, position that they were in when they tried to operate on the cardiac artery, on the uh, cardiac artery with um, general anaesthesia, uh, 
but they could do it under local anesthesia. Um, how did they know that the circle of Willis was functional in one method and not the other? Yeah, I'll, I'll go more into that. I probably summarised uh, too much. So um, w- when you clamp uh, the artery and if the circle isn't patent, if it's uh, blocked itself in some way, uh, the patient will show some adverse response. Uh, so if they're squeezing, their food, they might not be able to with one hand, or if they're speaking, they might lose uh, the power of speech or some words, or they might even uh, change their conscious level. So that's how we know in the awake patient that the circle is, is not working. But all of that's impossible in the anesthetized patient. You just have to hope. So. Near the beginning of your talk, you spoke about the great uh, anatomical features in the brain, which this group um, observed and gave names to. Um, now, I've heard it said that the, in, in a living person, the brain has a consistency rather like porridge. <laughs> And when medical students dissect the brain, they do so in a brain which has been fixed and hardened with formalin or something like that. Um, Were um, Wren's group able to fix the brain in some way? That's a really good question. Um, And I'll answer it advisedly. In general, not. They were operating on fresh cadavers. They, They literally claimed the bodies. Uh, as they uh, died, uh, uh, for, you know, if they were hanged, uh, as in the case of, of Anne Green, uh, and uh, started dissect- dissecting straight away. Uh, uh, I'm not aware that they actively preserved them for, uh, um, you know, later uh, dissection in the way that we do now. But your point's w- well made, you're, and, and you're right. There is a difference between the fresh cadaver and the uh, preserved uh, cadaver, and that's why. You know, that lightning strike student was, was so important for the particular discovery. It's not, not so much porridge as a good panna cotta. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, uh, sort of striking, especially in a hall like this, surrounded by these portraits of people from that era. And as we both grown up in a world of <clears throat> hyper specialization, whether there's a place or whether a polymath can emerge from our current education system or whether we constrain the creativity of great minds? I think that's a very good question. It's not (coughs) only at a student level. I fear it's at researcher level, the whole exercise of the research excellent framework and so on. It doesn't give credit to polymaths at all. You have to dig deeper and deeper and just do one, you know, fewer and fewer things to gain the the relevant credit. So I, I, I think we've... We've not structured our system uh, from start to finish, you could say, to encourage that uh, approach. And I think that's why institutions like this are so important, actually, to bring people together and say, look, this is an opportunity, an outlet to discuss these wider things of interest. You could argue that the, the guilds that have grown up in cities like London and Amsterdam are actually constraining that, the ba- building boundaries between people rather than breaking them down. Yeah. Yeah. On the resuscitation of Anne Green, I don't know how available the observations are. What's your theory on the pathology that she suffered that was sufficient enough for her to be verified as dead? I don't know how that was done in that, <laughs> I mean, in that era, but, but you know, able to be resuscitated. That's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, without too much gruesome detail, um, you know, if you're correctly hanged, uh, then uh, the hangman's fracture is something that severs the spinal cord and, and is a non-resuscitatable thing. So at best we can uh, speculate that she was partially asphyxiated. Uh, and so what she needed, uh, and she was probably cold, which helped her, and what she needed was the, was the oxygen, the purified air, so some form of ventilation and you know, perhaps a degree of cardiac compression just to bring her around. So I think... She was lucky that it wasn't, a, you know, it was a botched, a botched job, uh, and she was lucky that she found this group of people who, who knew sort of roughly what to do. So I think that's my best guess on, on that. Angle. I think the, the root cause analysis group would probably say it was bad knot tying or a short stool. Yes. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody, thank Professor you. Pandit.
absolutely brilliant lecture. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.